Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the City of Bunbury Business Improvement Workshops. My name is Shauna Willis, and I have the privilege of being your facilitator for today. Now, we wish to acknowledge, of course, the traditional owners of the land, the Wadandi Noongar people, and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Now, the city has partnered with BSW Connect to bring you this four-week workshop series. Now, they're all designed to help you move your business online, to learn how to run your business online safely, to identify the different marketing platforms that are available and their purposes, of course, and how you can grow or expand your business through connection, and through collaboration. Now, a little bit of housekeeping. You will notice that everyone is on mute and we kindly ask that you use the chat function for any comments and questions. Now, the chat function, which you can find usually right here at the bottom of your screen there. Uh, how about we test that out? Maybe uh, you can give us a hi or a cheerio just to make sure that that function is working. And we encourage you to pop up any questions uh, if you have any through the workshop. So hello to Robin Holler from Louise, thanks for that. And Kate, nice to uh, see you once more with us. Hi to you. Now, you might be thinking, I don't have data worth stealing, or my business is too small to even consider worrying about a cyber attack. But today, our presenter, David Harrison from Too Easy Computing, is here to tell us otherwise and tell us how that you can protect your business. So I'm going to hand over to you, David. Welcome, Thank step you. on up. All right, thanks very much. And hello, everyone. Uh, so yes, today we're going to cover online uh, best practices. Um, we're going to bring up a slide. Um, that's basically got our, um, our comments there. Uh, basically, we're going to cover uh, the next slide will be uh, knowing what you need uh, so basically all the essentials and uh, why and what you need. Uh, VPN, what is it and do you need it? Because a lot of people are impression they need a VPN but they actually don't. So we're going to explain what it is and, and the purpose of it, the true purpose. Uh, security essentials, things that you need to be really watching out for and things that you need to really focus on. Um, also, uh, how to identify scam emails, a very brief cover of that um, so you can kind of get an understanding of where and how people get uh, uh, fraud actions uh, acted between them on those kind of things. Uh, backup uh, should always be a plan B as well. We will also cover some stories, uh, basically uh, some based on news articles, other ones from our of local businesses and so forth have been affected, and then we'll go back to you guys for some questions. Um, so knowing what you need, um, that's the first one that we're gonna cover. Uh, I'd say it's a lot like insurance. A lot of people turn around and go, I don't need full cover insurance, it's not needed. I haven't had an accident in 10 years. But then you have an accident. My mate drove back from Perth and uh, he, uh, he was tired and he had a Subaru, drove him to back up a four wheel drive, four wheel drive was fine, his car cost $7,000. So it's very important knowing the essentials. And as Shauna said, it's, uh, we all think it won't happen to us. Um, uh, cyber security is not prejudice, um, and I'll explain that as well. I commonly hear people say, I have nothing to uh, steal, nothing worth of value, um, what's the worst they can do, uh, because you're not sure what happens. Hackers um, only attack companies, that's also uh, false, but they do exploit the fact once they find the company's been hacked. Um, so I'll give you an example. I had an old lady, uh, she had a telemarketer call up saying that she was from uh, Telstra, and that her MBA is going to cut off, get cut off if she doesn't do something now. So she gets them in. Um, basically, she goes to the web link. Um, they use a program called TeamViewer, which text uses as well, gets in. Um, basically, runs around, charges her $240 to her credit card. So the first thing they've got now is her credit card details. The second thing that happens then is um, they say, yep, yeah, okay, you're good. So she's happy. And that $240 covered a lifetime work of support, which they called her multiple times a month afterwards asking for more money. But the worst thing that happened about this is they actually stole her Telstra details. And uh, then she got a $3,000 bill from Telstra because they were using her Telstra account for fraudulent activities, including downloads. So the things that What's worse that can happen is the things that we don't even think about. Uh, identity theft. 
You know, uh, you see Facebook, you know, oh, uh, play this game. What's your date of birth, or your address, you know, your mother's maiden name. Uh, then they, you know, stalk you, they contact you via email, if it's visible on Facebook, and now they've got your whole identity. So there's that kind of thing to think about as well. Stealing your data, uh, even just your internet history, because they sell those statistics, you know, may not affect you, you might slow your computer a bit down if they've got something on there, but that happens. We had something in the medical industry where a hacker actually, it was a script, so it was yet again not prejudiced, that's got on a machine, and it was data mining Bitcoin from their machine. So they were getting a massive amount of internet usage, um, also their machine was spiking. Lucky enough, it was monitored by our team, so we were able to see that the spike in there. We found out that someone was trying to use their machine to mine Bitcoin. Basically, Bitcoin's an internet, basically, currency. currency in some way. Um, it's not really recognised, uh, you can't use it much. Uh, there's obviously discrepancies in that, but Basically, people are making money off them. So, most cyber security attacks, as I said, are scripts. So, it doesn't matter if you're a business, it doesn't matter your, your race, your male or female, it doesn't matter, they don't care. It's a script. If you act and do these things, e.g., click on that email, uh, we've had people look up menus on the internet, you know, and then they get a script that's activated in the background. All those things can happen, and once those things take effect, the script basically gets activated, then it's actually up to the hacker and what they do. Because most of the time, they will actually encrypt all your data, um, which means that all your data will be locked out, will be password protected, and then they will hold you at ransom. That's the most common one. So how is this all relevant to knowing what you need? Well, basically, knowing what they're going to be doing to you sheds light on what, how it's going to affect you. So, I always ask the question, would it affect you if you lost all your photos or your data? Um, would it affect you if you had to get your computer wiped and reloaded? Some people have technical knowledge to do that themselves, so they don't care. Because when you've got to reload your computer, if you've got a virus, uh, people don't think about the fact that you've got to put all your programs back on there, you've got to put your emails back on there, you've got to set it all back up how it was. It's not a black and white scenario. Um, if you get if you get someone trying to hack your bank account or they get into your bank account uh, via some kind of cyber security loophole, the banks will actually demand you take your computer to a computer store to get it wiped. Even if you can do it yourself, they won't allow it. You've got to take it to a computer store. You have to pay a computer guy to wipe it, and then they will sign the bank doc for you. So those things it's all costing money. So when you say I've got nothing to lose. You do, you've got time, you've got you know, money to get pay a tech to reload your machine so you can reuse your, um, your computer for banking. There's all those things taken into consideration. So when people say that um, they've got nothing to worry about, they don't need antivirus, they don't need to worry about security, uh, don't, backup's not a, not a concern, well, that's kind of starting to become more relevant when you look at the whole perspective. Because if it had a backup and something went wrong, you could just restore it, all your emails, all your icons are where they were, the printer's still there, and you're back up and going in no time at all. So, and backup software is very, very inexpensive, and we'll cover that down the track as well. So, internet security software, of course, is a must nowadays. Um, there's another thing called two factor authentication, which I strongly recommend, um, and in most businesses, it's compulsory nowadays. Um, and also, in the banking um, and a lot of the websites like Xero, uh, two factor authentication is uh, compulsory. I will go into what two factor authentication is more a bit further down the track. Uh, so, VPN, what is it, and do you need it? Because uh, I do get this a lot. I had an old guy come in only the other day saying, I must have a VPN, and he only looks up stuff on the internet. Um, so a VPN is short for a, a virtual private network. Um, basically, you've got to remember, it connects a computer to another location. So generally, as a perspective, if you uh, have a computer and you need to access something at work, whether that's a server, or you know, certain aspects at work, maybe even a printer um, or uh, some files that's not uh, accessible except at work, um, then a VPN basically fills that gap. So it uses the internet uh, as basically the road and it connects your computer to wherever you need to go. 
Uh, so I, I consider it like a big fence around your property. If you need to get into your work um, for um, to access things like we talked about, uh, rather than just having it open to the internet, you create a secure link to it, like a big gate. So then they've got to get over that big gate before they get to your front door, um, rather than just let them straight to your front door. And that's what the VPN is, is that big gate to stop them getting to your business core you know, um, infrastructure. Um, obviously you have that password protected, but it's another layer of security um, and it's a must nowadays. Um, so why and do you need a VPN? The most common one is, are you ever at home and go, oh, I need to catch up on some work, but I can't do that because I need to be at work to do that. That is the why. So you need to think about, is there a why? Because um, a lot of stuff now is cloud-based. So therefore, you know, it's easy, you don't need VPNs, it's cloud-based, it's already secured. Um, we've obviously uh, security protocols, um, so that's a good one to go for. But if there's a point where your work has got a lot of stuff, uh, like ourselves, a lot of our stuff is not on the internet. Um, the only way we can get to it is by creating a virtual link to our work, and then we've got access to those files, um, because they're not directly online. We have to be part of our actual work infrastructure. That's what a VPN does, it connects you to your work as if you're in the office. A lot of people think, a VPN is to hide and be anonymous on the internet. It's not true. It's, uh, it is, it's not. So like what we talked about, when you connect your home computer to work, you know where work is, you know what work is, and you know where it is. These ones that you be anonymous on the internet, you're connecting from your home to somewhere on the internet somewhere on the internet, in America, wherever. It's a two-way authentication. So yes, you browse through their network effectively, their, their office, so therefore it looks like you're in America, so it's a bit like, you know, you're hiding where your location is, but they can also say you think that's on your system. There's a company, uh, people use this as well to like watch American Netflix and so forth, but they don't realise there is obviously security um, complications on that. October last year, there was a company called NordVPN that provided a service so people could watch Netflix by the um, uh, American Netflix in Australia. They got exposed to a cyber security attack and potentially those hackers had access to everyone's computers. Like the big fence, they were at your front door. They were almost actually in your garage. They just had to get through the garage door to, um, to your house. So having a VPN is almost like giving them, you know, leaving your garage door open, and now they're just going to get through the passageway entrance. So VPN in summary, if you need something at work and it's a hindrance because you need to be at work to access it, that's your driver for having a VPN. If you want to hide on the internet and play games, then don't do it because it's a two-way streak and it opens up a can of games. Security essentials. And this is probably one of the core components on it. This is where we're going to cover the two-factor authentication, security essentials, uh, as in passwords, and, and do's and don'ts. Um, as discussed, uh, antivirus and backup systems are a must. Um, the antivirus is obviously trying to prevent. The backup is your plan B. This, you know, if it breaks out, you've got an option to go back to. Um, but having a good password is also important. Having your password that's password, or your name being Bruce, and your password's Bruce, but I'm going to put a one at the end, um, is not secure. Um, you'll find that it's getting tracked down in a lot more nowadays. Uh, if you're trying to put a name in, uh, EG, your name's Bruce, and your password's got Bruce in it, often these uh, websites will now say, no, you can't have your, your username in the password at all. Um, well, people think you've got to put in a massive password, a 24 character password. Um, now, uh, yeah, okay, 24 character password is going to be a lot harder for a hacker to guess. When we're talking about automated and scripts, there are programs out there that hackers use that literally they call brute force. So I'll just go through random passwords, algorithms until they crack it. Um, we had a customer, I'll go into the stories that was done very similar like that, where they use algorithms and at least ch chunks of code, like, you know, admin and Bruce and so forth, but we'll talk more about that. So password, really you want to have it something that's not common, uh, not your date of birth, not your name, not your surname, not your mother's maiden name, make it, make it something and then normally throw in something easy. I normally say put in your dog's name, put in your phone number for work and maybe put three explanation marks on the end. Just make it a little bit mixed up. Then we come down to the two-factor authentication that I talked about or 2FA which you might see floating around. 
2F A is what it says. So your first form of authentication is your username and password. Um, so that's what we all use generally. But if a hacker somehow gets that password information, whether they've been spying on your computer or they just uh, use a program to guess it, the second form of authentication needs to be some kind of consent given to you. It's a notification that says, hey, you put in your username and password, I need to confirm it is you. That's a two-factor authentication, it's a second factor. Now, how that's delivered is text message is a common one. You get a text message and that says someone's trying to use your account. You know whether it's you or not, because obviously you just tried to put your username and password in, and then it'll give you a code to confirm it's you. Um, the other one is a program. You can get an app on your phone, it's called an authenticator app. Um, it's a bit like a band token or randomly change. The problem with that is if you smash your phone, drop your phone, whatever, um, they do have a backup and restores, which generally is painful as well. It's really painful to move that authenticator app off a device into another phone. So although it's good, it, it, you don't want to swap your phone, it's painful. Um, there is obviously other programs you can use, cloud-based ones, but then that means it's in the sky as well, so personal choice. I, the text message one, although it can be debated, is probably the most reliable one because it goes to your mobile phone, you change your mobile phone, you've got the same number. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. The good thing about the, um, the text method as well, the authenticator app doesn't give you a notification that someone's tried to sign in, depending on the criteria. But the text message one always will, because it will say someone's trying to access your account, here's your confirmation code, and you're like, hang on, I'm at a beach. There's no way that it was me. So you've got, now it's like, so you've got an action to ignore it, which probably is not the best idea, or change your password, because now you know someone's been trying to use your account. So the text message one is good. So that's what two-factor authentication is. It's basically giving you a second layer if used right, also as a notification that someone's been using your account. And that means, you know, if someone sees your password entered somewhere, they try and guess it, you've got that notification. Uh, so you'll find, as I was mentioning, most websites now is compulsory two-factor authentication. A lot of workplaces uh, that we deal with, um, their staff are compulsory two-factor authentication. Uh, they can go to their personal mobile, that's fine. Um, and a lot of them do do text messages because if the staff leaves, um, it's a lot easier to reset that two-factor authentication method for another staff member, um, or um, they can lock them out using the same security protocols from administ administrative purposes. So definitely introduce two-factor authentication. So security essentials, um, as I discussed, uh, you will find will actually cover you with your antivirus. So you want antivirus, you want backup, and as a safety precaution, you want to have a second form of authentication rather than just a username and password, wherever applicable, wherever you can, it's recommended. Covering how to identify scam emails. This is a common one, not an easy one, because again, obviously their job is to make it uh, more and more complicated uh, for people to identify these issues. Um, what you'll find, uh, this is a slide here, this is on a computer system. Um, as we talked about uh, two weeks ago, it's not as easy on a mobile phone, but on a computer system, you can actually hover over and you can see where they're trying to send you. So I've obviously click here to claim $100,000. Um, so if I hover over that, you can see it's trying to take, us, take you to our website. Um, that's the easiest way. If you get a Telstra bill, um, then you'll find that it will actually if you hover over the links, it should say telstra.com. Um, if you, it's an ATO thing, it should say uh, wagov.au. So try and use some form of association in that manner. Um, when you go to a web link, there's a thing called a URL bar. Just check to make sure that's correct as well. The other thing that we found uh, often happens in uh, email scams is people use scare tactics. You've been hacked. Uh, I've seen you nude doing naughty things, it's a common one, um, on your webcam, and that's quite amusing when the person hasn't got a webcam. Um, but use common sense as much as you can in those things. Uh, did, I, did I order something from FedEx? No, so don't open a FedEx email. Um, ANZ Banking, your pass is about to expire. Uh, if you're not with ANZ, then don't click on it. Um, the same thing with those emails. They, the only time a threatening email may have relevance is, uh, is when they will prove themselves. 
And the only one I'll say in is that I will send you your password in the email. If they send you your password in the email, then that's when you take interest in it. If they say that they've got your password, they threaten in, in basically with no proof, they normally got nothing. It's a, it's a spam email going out to millions of people seeing who's going to buy it. It's basically chucking a line in the water. So we're going to go into your backups now. So with your backups, as I said, it should always be your plan B. Now, they're called a 321 backup. Um, basically, you should have three copies of your data. So you've got, uh, you store one copy off-site, so you have one backup off-site, and then you have two other forms of backup. Obviously, you'll have your one that you actually work from, and then a backup of that. So you have your, what we call production data or your primary information. You have a backup of that somewhere, like a USB hard drive or so forth, and then one off-site. Uh, OneDrive and Dropbox have got retention, so they can go back to about 30 days. So if, if something happens to you on my mind, you can, you can revert back. So it's a really handy way to have free backup. What you've got to remember with cyber security attacks, when they find out a way to get into your system, shall they do that? They will, uh, everything you've got access to, they've got access to, because they're acting on your behalf. They, they generally access it under your user account. So therefore, if you've got your USB hard drive plugged in with your backups, then they'll go, oh, cool, delete. You know, or the script will do that, um, shell, because I mean, scripts also designed to seek out backup forms and delete them. So you, you want to make sure the backup software you use is, uh, is obviously applicable for security as well. I mean, we often put a backup software on people's computer called Veeam. It's a free program, it's in the handout, but that brochure will go through the links to there. Um, the problem with that, though, is no security. So it's free and it's by a enterprise grade company. Um, really good, but you wanna make sure that hard drive's unplugged whenever you're, you're not using it. Because what we talked about, if you do get a cyber security breach and that hard drive's plugged in, well, they've got access to your backup too. There's another program we use a lot, um, it's called Acronis. Um, obviously there's other ones out there, I'm just covering the essentials. Um, Acronis backup, true image, is a common one used by small business and homes. It's so cheap. I think it's as low, you can buy it online, it, it's safe to buy online. Um, if not, you can buy it through a computer store. Um, it's about $45 for a single user, about $150 for free users. But the thing is, the new 2021 just came out this week. It's also got antivirus built in. And even the before that, uh, it will deny even you access to your backups. If you try to go into your backups and hit delete, it will deny you. Um, because it's got a protection agent to actually secure your backups. <coughs> That's why Acronis is heavily recommended by us to small businesses. Um, there is more the best products out there, um, but why pay more when obviously a cheaper product will do the same job. Um, Acronis True Image works on pretty much any modern computer. It doesn't use much. Uh, it has also got options for cloud, or you can back up to your OneDrive or so forth. There's heaps of ways to use it, but most importantly, it secures your backups. So it gives you that form of protection. Because um, that's the worst thing you want to do is get hacked and then find your backups been hacked too, which does happen. Okay, a bit of story time. I'm not a joke story from the crypto. Because um, crypto is the most common thing. Crypto, what people don't, people that don't know crypto, is where they, a script or actually hands-on hacker will basically password protect all your files. You have a little nice note on your desktop, sometimes they even make it animated, where they'll say, pay us lots of money um, and we'll give you the password to all your information. <sighs> to, for things I talked about, the backup, um, cyber security, um, two-factor authentication, they're all your essentials as we discussed, but don't get me wrong, you, anyone can get hacked. Uh, and now, for example, I spoke to you last time about Toll. Um, Toll got hacked. And I just found out recently they got hacked twice. Um, so the reason they got hacked is because the IT measures put in place effect, didn't have an effective backup. Uh, you've got to give them credit. They're obviously, their infrastructure and their setup is going to be vastly big to manage. So, therefore, for smaller businesses, using a Cronus with a four terabyte hard drive from Officeworks for 170 bucks, cheap, cheap backup. Well, so 300 bucks, you've got yourself a backup system. Um, uh, Toll was obviously going to be a lot more. But they infiltrated the Toll network, not once, um, so, but twice. So, 
That kind of thing can happen to people that have invested a large amount of money on infrastructure. So don't go hard on your IT guy here, Pat, because they, they will find ways. That's their job, to find ways to actually get into your systems. The other one is uh, Telstra got hacked recently, um, only two weeks ago, um, caused an outage on a Sunday. So these big guys are getting hacked. So if they're getting to the big guys, uh, that would be hands on, but obviously they're always going to find ways to get in. We find it comes in waves. Our customers, we've got monitoring set up. Um, some customers have, have not invested in VPN, um, but we've basically made security protocols where a couple of passwords wrong, it blocks that, that internet address for life until we flip and block it. And also on one weekend, we'll find that uh, we've got about five sites that don't use VPN, um, but heavily as password protected and basically, uh, one, I think one site's one password is wrong, you're, locked, you're blocked out. But on the weekend, you find that all those sites get hit at once. So they kind of go in waves um, and they'll go by geological location or they'll go by IP range or servers, um, like as in what internet provider you use and they'll sniff out whatever's available and try and get in. So, and they don't care whether you're a home user or a business. If they see there's, there's a door, they're gonna try and, they're gonna try and pick it. So that's why the VPN, what we talked about, is like that fence stops them getting to your door to pick it. Um, I mean, my mother locked herself out of the house and I was, I was actually surprised the locksmith there. It was as I, and that's what happens a lot. Um, we actually had, we were in the middle of a migration of a customer and we had a hacker uh, basically try and get in. And it was really interesting because we looked at the log and they were a monitored customer but we went through the log. We're not saying monitor customers, we've got security software, we actually will email us if someone's attempting to get access to the site with an incorrect password. But this customer uh, is a small business, um, so we obviously didn't want to spend that capital on a monthly expense, which is fine. We went through and had a look, and they actually were trying for two months. They were trying admin, administrator, Tom, Jill, you know, accounts, uh, inquiries. And they were using that and they were obviously using bank passwords. Unfortunately, one person had password one. So, and that was Tom. Good on you, Tom. <laughs> um, sorry for when comes out there. Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, so anyway, uh, I was in the administrator account doing the migration, lucky enough, um, moving them to a new server, and I had someone join my session. And I thought that was interesting. And, uh, and then they downloaded, they didn't know I was there. And uh, then they downloaded files um, to be able to hack all the accounts on the server, the administrator account, the backup accounts, everything. Uh, long story short, obviously I've locked them out and cut it out. It was, a, it was a matter of luck. But long story short, we found out it was an ex-employee. So this is an international company. Um, they had overseas counterparts. There was a discrepancy for an overseas counterpart. They pay twenty five dollars for a hacker to get in and wreak havoc. So yeah, so they get paid twenty five dollars. I don't care about twenty five dollars, but to know of a company or value, um, that's what they're after. So twenty five dollars to get paid for a lead to make lots of money, uh, that's actually a good model for a cyber criminal. So these are the things you got to be careful about. It's very easy for someone to get disgruntled with your company, whether it's a customer or whatever, if they, they don't have to be, these guys are proper science and they figured out the dark web and how to do it. A uh, bit of Googling, don't go to the dark web. That's just number one, because it's like walking in a minefield. Yeah, <laughs> you can't eat, you're gonna lose limbs. Um, but the fact of the matter is, um, it's really easy for a disgruntled customer to get there. So by having a username and password with a two-factor authentication, it means that if someone does get your details, they've got access. Um, I'll cover off on oh, probably one more um, until we go out, maybe two more. Um, the number one where people don't realise with cyber hacking, it's not all about just encrypting your data. Um, uh, I'll lead on to two parts here. We had one customer, uh, this was from a previous employee employment uh, before my, my business. I was working for a uh, corporate division and we had a mining company on the books. Um, they had a $250,000 invoice that was sent out. And, um, and with the $250,000 invoice that was sent out, it wasn't paid. So they, they just followed, they sent a follow-up email. The response from the US was, no, that invoice was paid. 
a cyber criminal, I'll say, access that email on the email server, change the payee details, and then re-embedded the email to go forward to the recipient. So when the recipient got it, the payee details were different. Uh, that the as AFP was involved in that, which um, we just handled. Um, but yeah, so they'll do that kind of extent to get money. It's not always about your data. The other one we had was a financial institute. Um, quite a few employees, so it's, uh, that's what they love um, because having a few employees means there can be confusion. They managed to, they didn't have the two-factor authentication in their emails. And that's why I'm pointing out how important that is. They had someone actually access their email system and they sat in it for about a month. So they were reading, because you know when you get the bad grammar, I think coming from me, which has got bad grammar anyway, but generally you'll find with bad grammar and uh, wording, you'll find that's easy to pick up. But what these guys were doing um, is they were actually watching how people wrote and how they talked and they used the copy and paste to replicate the, the communication. They knew who to contact and when to, for what to get paid. So again, a matter of uh, luck and circumstance, they sent an email saying, I need a uh, large amount of money paid ASAP to this super fund, and these are the details. And that person was actually, the person that sent the email supposedly was actually off sick that day. So that was what sparked interest. But that could have easily gone through um, because they knew who to email, what to ask for, the priority um, in there, I'm out of office, I'm attending stuff, I need to start an SAP. They, they, they knew how to get things uh, triggered and action fast. So knowing what essentials you need is knowing what, they, what they're looking out for. So even if you're a small business and you've got free staff, if you're out, and your staff member gets an email saying, pay this ASAP, and obviously that's part of their job role, now, 10 grand could be a lot of a small business. So uh, even a home person, you know, uh, this, this money to be taken. So those are the things to consider. Um, and it's very important to, to look at your cybersecurity. So we'll go over some Q&A now, um, and I'll see we've got some questions there. I've been pretty told that some real giveaways of hackers is to use misspelled words, random capitalization of letters, email addresses, but are hackers getting more sophisticated techniques uh, using what kind of ransom fee? Yeah, so yeah, do you, do you honor this and free up your system? The problem with ransomware, so when they to protect your, your data and then try and make it all secure um, so you have to pay them money to get the password uh, it's a business model for them so it's a big no-no for them not to actually come through with the password the problem with it though is they i've seen it a lot they all have a look to see where and what data you got if and it's not the first time they go into a negotiation so you'll pay them and then they'll go yeah no that's not enough and they will ask for more. Um, there was one customer which I can't mention. Um, it was a Perth customer, it wasn't one of ours, it was from one of our um, uh, partners. Um, it was in the medical industry, it started off with $5,000, went up to $250,000 on their first hit uh, because they realised it was the medical industry. Um, it ended up, you know, I think they ended up negotiating around $25,000, $30,000, got a data back. Um, but in saying what I said, uh, it, although it's frowned upon about not getting your data back if you, um, uh, if you pay them the money, there is cases where you won't get your data back if you pay them the money. Because as we talked about, it's all different syndicates. It's not the same companies. So they will actually turn around and they will target um, who they want. And if it's, a, if it's a syndicate of some of the young kids, they, um, they don't care about your data, they just want the money, and uh, they'll just basically take your money and run. So that comes down to why your backups are so important in that aspect. Um, we've got another one there, do we? I've previously been told that some real, oh no, there we go. You often get emails, warnings about phishing and fear. Yeah, so this is again why your internet security is important, because a lot of your internet security products will actually scan your websites, 
um, scan for anything that could be potentially trying to steal information off you. Um, phishing and, and spear phishing is basically where they're trying to access your web browser to steal information. Uh, Google Chrome actually has just released an update where they're actually now making sure you need to have a, a new form of SSL security. Now, SSL security is means that you've got to get a security certificate to have your web page on the internet. Um, Google checks that and it will make sure that it's actually valid. So Google's actually uh, making progress to also make the web browsers more secure so you don't get your informa personal information stolen. Um, another one that a lot of people feel is cookies. They, um, they try and stop all your cookies, but what you've got to remember is with cookies, a lot of websites use that to kind of store your preferences. So it's not ideal to turn off your cookies. Um, but to have decent security software that will actually integrate with your web browser. So when you, you can browse, you'll some can even have like an icon on your web browser and it will actually say this site's safe, so forth. I mean that's the ideal way to go. Uh, I've got one here. My business is a home-based business and I use OneDrive and Google Drive for everything. Do I need to use a VPN at home. Well, as mentioned, uh, cloud services now, that's kind of stopped a lot of your um, your requirements for VPNs because uh, one of the biggest things, as I said, you've got to have a driver. Like, why do I need a VPN? It's the fact of, like, in the past, it'd be, oh, I need to access that file from work, but it's on the server at work. There's still a lot of IT companies out there pushing big servers, I and mean, don't get me wrong, there was a place for that. Uh, Toll, for example. Sorry, jokes. Um, but, uh, but there's places for big servers. Um, but one of the things that we've been doing is transitioning a lot of small businesses under 10 computers and 10 users to OneDrive or Google Drive um, because it's free. Um, and also it's got some form of backup already built in, or retention at least. Um, and no, it, it means you don't need a VPN. So if you've got an old server um, at work um, and you can only access those files, um, at work, well, obviously having that that is secure because it's not on the internet, but it's also can be a hindrance. If you switch to OneDrive, which we've done for a lot of people, that does eliminate the fact that you have to worry about having all your stuff um, in one location that can't be accessed by the internet. Um, VPNs don't cost much to set up. I mean, you're probably talking about 500 bucks, 600 bucks of the hardware, so it's not expensive, but it's also a lot cheaper if you can use OneDrive. The advantage of what we're on that way, advantages with OneDrive and, um, and Google, you've got to remember as well, it's got, uh, OneDrive has got autosave. So if you're in a Word document, it autosaves. So there's other technology behind that, apart from version change. So you can go back to different versions, as I talked about. Um, get a staff member to delete something. Instead of having to turn around and get your IT guy to go on the server, restore a backup, um, you can simply right click on it and restore a file. So those are the things to consider as well um, with modern day cloud technology. Uh, obviously you always consult your IT provider to find out what's going to be best for you. Um, the password management side, um, that's very interesting. Um, it's personal opinion. I don't like having my passwords saved on the cloud service. So for example, um, uh, Dashlane um, or Load is, is a nice program. I'm not a fan of having all your passwords saved in one location on the internet. So I kind of, what we talked about, it's almost like having your little black book in your safe. <coughs> one of my customers had a black book in the top drawer, which had the internet banking details in it. Um, so what I do recommend is if you're going to use your password management, I do believe in it. Um, we use a program called uh, KeyPass. Um, KeyPass is an offline um, password management system. It's encrypted, it uses government grade encryption. Of course, it's not online, it means it's going to be harder to get hacked. Um, KeyPass can then, the file can be saved in your, um, your OneDrive or your cloud, uh, whatever it is, and access that way. What's the difference between accessing a password file in your OneDrive to Dashlane? Well, Dashlane is a website. So once, a, like what we talked about with the VPN site that got hacked, hypothetically, if someone hacked Dashlane, they could have access to all the subfiles and so forth. That's the thing you've got to take into consideration. Where if you have your password file to save in OneDrive, <coughs> it's too much work for hackers to go to your OneDrive and then try and decrypt your password file in your OneDrive. 
So that's the difference between having your stuff uh, stored outside of a cloud service. It's like what we talked about for emails as well. With the emails, um, a lot of people are using a program called Office 365. Um, it's also called a hosted exchange, and that's where Microsoft hosts all your emails. Really good platform. Um, but like Gmail and like Hotmail.com, it's really good for hackers because they can just stop what we talked about. They can randomly hack that until the cows come home, and if they get locked out of one account, they try another one, and so forth. If you uh, actually got two factor authentication, then that is what is a good thing to have. But the fact that they can go to one spot and potentially hack thousands of people, that's a hacker's dream because they can just let a script go, get one of their minions just to go, go for it. So anything where like Dashlane, password manager online, anything that um, is, a, is a one location online with uh, an office that's a service, you've got to consider the pros and cons of that. The problem with a lot of these password managers as well is that they actually don't have any two-factor authentication. Um, if you do have two-factor authentication on your cloud password management, that's not so bad. So that's one of the things that I recommend on that. Have we got anyone on? Any other questions in the group? Yep. There we go. Okay. So Dropbox. Dropbox is, yet again, um, they've got two-factor authentication. Um, a Dropbox and OneDrive, they're pretty safe. Um, if you had a VPN and your own storage, obviously that's the most secure. But as we talked about previously, uh, big companies like BigPond and Telstra uh, are getting, uh, sorry, Telstra and Toll are getting hacked. Um, there's always a chance, like what degree, how far do you lock down your stuff? So to answer, my, to answer your question about the OneDrive and um, Dropbox, yes, it's secure. I mean, it's, you've got just as much chance of being hacked um, than anything else. Um, you could go to extreme lengths, VPNs, offline storage, like what we do, uh, but still anything is possible. So what you've got to remember with the OneDrive um, and your Dropbox um, and Google Drive, they have version changes. So if someone did get in there and they wreaked havoc on your system, it's that plan B that we talked about. You've got to have a plan B. You've got to have something to go back to. So by having um, version changes, I mean, for those that might not know version changes, it's where every time something happens to a file, it creates a pointer to go back to that. Um, that means that you can always go back to a previous version, even if it's a point where you just say something badly. Um, the other convenience of Dropbox and uh, OneDrive, as I talked about, uh, opposed to having a backup system where you actually have to, something goes wrong, you have to go back in the backup system, Dropbox and OneDrive, most of it's a right click and restore previous version. It's a lot easier. So on that management level, uh, as we talked about on the IT side, it's a lot easier as well. Right. Thank you, David. It's right, a big right. world, the cyber security, isn't it? It is. It um, is. Have you got any suggestions for the best antivirus, uh, antivirus software? Yeah. What, um, what do you think? I always say use recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's websites that you can look at statistics, but like what we talked about, anything is better than nothing. Um, but if you look at statistical reviews, uh, the two top ones is Bitdefender and Kaspersky. Um, but then Kaspersky, if you want to start speaking hairs, it's German, uh, or Russian, sorry. So you kind of, you know, so even though when they do statistical reviews, it's all based on features and price. So you can get wrapped up in that. Um, any antivirus is better than nothing. Uh, the good thing about Windows 10 is that it has got a built-in Windows Defender and that has actually come a long way from its previous versions. So it, it will cover you quite a bit. The only thing, if you're a small business, um, I did cover that briefly in some of our conversations, if you're a small business and you want that peace of mind, it's not, most antiviruses will do a good job. But the question is, is it doing the job? Because that's the problem, if it's disabled, because there's, um, there's antiviruses or there's viruses out there that will disable your antivirus and then put itself in its place to look like an antivirus. So the antivirus then becomes the virus itself. 
Um, if you've got an IT company, have a chat about managed antivirus. Um, if you're an IT company, there shouldn't be much more um, because managed antivirus means that your IT guys get to see what's happening on your antivirus level. Is it online? Is it working? Um, we had a justice of a piece that was on our books. It was, it's an individual um, paying $60 a year for managed antivirus. Uh, they were workaholic. I know they were offline for five days. I gave her a call. She was in Bali. So I was like, cool, good for you. <laughs> um, obviously, before recent events. Yeah. But that's, having a managed antivirus, if you're a small business, uh, is worthwhile. Otherwise, yeah, uh, Windows 10 um, Defender or, um, or whatever your IT guy recommends should be quite applicable. All right, so shop around, do your research, and again, don't just install and think that's it, I can leave it. No. Make it an unmanaged system that you've got going. Yes. Uh, a bit of a question about spam emails yes. that come into everyone's inbox. We love those, don't we? Is there a way to update what email thinks is spam? Are you able to control some of those elements? So we talked about the Office 365 or hosted exchange, which is a Microsoft email system. Gmail's got a very similar thing, and so does Hotmail. But, the, but Microsoft on the business platform, they are really trying to focus on blocking out this spam. Mm -hmm. um, they are introducing spam modules. We've gone down the path is, the problem with spam on a business, where's the line where you're going to potentially block business to... Yeah something that, that's actually oh, spam. Yeah. So you've got to find it in between. We've gone down the path multiple times with customers putting in very expensive spam solutions and then we've had to really tailor it back because they weren't getting emails from big companies. Um, I'm talking about like big companies up in near Collie. Um, so my advice with spam is if you've got email, you should be using Microsoft Host Exchange or the Office 365 platform because it's the most reliable email system. Um, does cost more, but they are improving the spam on it. Mm. Uh, the other thing is it's got auditing on it as well, which means you can't be able to trace where you can actually go through and see what's happened within your email. Yeah, so, yeah. okay, all right, great. Uh, quickly, just to recap on some of the points, passwords. Yes. All right, don't be like Tom, is what we've all taken away from today. Um, <laughs> and look at the two-factor authentication. Yes. Uh, look at the offline um, key pass that you were talking about, the, yeah. the offline uh, password manager. Yeah. Um, and some interesting stats we were looking at, seven character password yeah. potentially can take about five hours to break or had, have you got some information on that as opposed to the difference it may make if you look at having a 10 character password? Yeah, so with the passwords, um, one of the things I should have mentioned as well is uh, usernames is a thing that's forgotten as well. Like if it was Tom dot surname, then they would have to guess for Tom dot surname before they get to the password as well. Yeah. Um, to come to your question about how hard is it to crack a password, those those password crackers they work in obviously they there's the 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 old school one which will just go through all the A's and B's and but then there's other ones which will have algorithms like it will have um, you know password one password two, password three. Um, so it will put in the whole words, you know, the common words, you know, okay. uh, for example, admin and admin. So, uh, so the secret to your password and it being hacked um, in that five, uh, five, uh, five hours, for example, uh, if you had a, yeah, if you had, if you had a combination of words, it's quite feasible that they could get hacked in five hours. Okay. If you, if it wasn't uh, logical, so like what we talked about, if you had um, your details and then your work phone number and then put some characters at the end, just that makes that that chunking of uh, of common words or phrases mm. makes it drag out longer. Yeah. So there is a variation to that. So the secret is, don't make it too easy. Yeah, as in life common, but don't make it my home ninety nine. Something like that. All the things we're always warned about, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. not generic and yeah, dog name, cat name, children. And so incorporate, yeah, yeah, incorporate random things like phone yeah. numbers, etc. Yeah, um, uppercase, lowercase. Yeah, because it doesn't have to be a point where you can't remember your password. That's the thing I say. Like a lot of people put passwords that you just cannot ever remember. 
Uh, although it's nice, it makes you, may give you a sense of security. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing is to make sure that you actually have a password, which uh, I normally use, uh, like, as I said, a phone number and maybe a location, not where you're born, of course. Um, and then uh, as my common one is using explanation mark for stars at the end. Uh, of course, all those additional um, signature yeah, yeah, characters. Yeah. And it can be one explanation mark. It can be one star at the end. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be. It's just to stop them paraphrasing and putting together mm. common phrases to generate your password. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All great advice. Absolutely. Uh, scam emails. Now, there are so many of these all the time. Check the email address. Yes. As you said, you need to just hover over the link before clicking on any of those emails um, that don't look right. So we emphasise that to everyone as well. Um, we are just checking here a message that we got from Kate. 60 year for managed antivirus. Yes, so we use the, uh, a lot of IT companies do a similar thing. I've seen models and like if you're a, if you've got maybe 10 or 100 computers, there's monthly um, installments as well you can use. Um, but so Bitdefender, they've got the retail product, uh, which obviously you install when it's just on your screen. Uh, then they've got the enterprise product. Um, uh, that's what we use, it's $60 a year. But you can have access to a management portal, which means you can actually, we have customers that are managed uh, by us and then uh, we call them hybrids, where they're managed by um, the business owner and we're kind of the plan B. So mm -hmm. with that, it means you get a work console. You can log in, you can see all your computers on there, you can click on them, you can do charts and reports, you can see who's been infected, you know, uh, when it was last scanned, when they were last updated, when they were last online, that's, that's the extent, because obviously there's privacy to be on that. So as a business owner, you can manage your staff yourself, um, uh, you can have a look at Bitdefender's website, um, you can purchase it online, I think if you go 10 or above, you can do it online, um, or obviously IT guys can provide you with alternative solutions, but it means that not really a big brother, but it means someone's got a bit of an eye on your antivirus. Because the biggest problem is, an antivirus is good as long as it's working. Mm -hmm. And that's where you don't always know. So it's good to have someone else monitoring and making sure that it's actually working for you. All right, great advice there on that one. Uh, lastly, back up, back up, back up. Uh, we've spoken about this, you've backed it up. Uh, another few tips on just making it as easy as possible, setting up some kind of system. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I talked about, yeah, Chrome's package is a very DIY. Um, it's why we sell a lot of it. Um, there's another program out there called Shadow Protect. Um, it's a lot more expensive, um, but it's more uh, enterprise, large business focused. For small business, uh, Chrome's is affordable. You know, um, 150 bucks for a couple of users, um, and that's a petrol license. That's that's outright. Right. Okay. Um, so petrol means you purchase it. There's no ongoing fee. So this, of course, you want to upgrade it. Um, and it's really user friendly. It's got a wizard. It will guide you through plugging your hard drive. You know, and it will do it all for you. If you need IT assistance, well, there's lots of guys out there that will be able to assist you with it. Um, it's a common product. Um, so yeah trying to keep it too easy. All right, back up, back up, back up. And Kate just wants to say thank you very much for that advice there, Dave, which isn't that cute. I love the idea of someone else monitoring it. <laughs> Always helpful, isn't it, to have someone else checking yes. with all that. All right, well, look, we hope you've uh, all learnt something. I know I certainly have that you can implement in your business or maybe give yourself a high five because you're doing a good job so far. Uh, next week, we are deep diving into marketing in 2020 and beyond. Uh, Anthony from Rethink Marketing and Lauren from Moshi, Moshi Marketing will cover the different social media platforms available and their uses. It's always interesting, uh, along with online marketing and more traditional marketing techniques as well. We are in the final weeks of these workshops. They've been so helpful. So if you would like to jump onto the next workshop or maybe you know someone who might certainly benefit and be interested in joining us, please register at the BSW Connect website. So that's lowercase bsw connect.com.au. Thank you again, no David. It's always so interesting to listen to you. Um, thanks to everyone that joined us today both online and here in the room. Good to see you. We hope you all have a wonderful day and look forward to seeing you all again next week. Thank you.